What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Invest Endeavor podcast. We are here with the March updates and things are going down. I am here with Dan Ginther. Thanks so much for hanging out, man. How you been? It's been good, Ian. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, crazy month again, for sure. But um, things are still moving. Real estate's still happening. Closings happen every day. Closings happen every day. And whether it's with us or without us, nonetheless, it is happening. And uh, we do want to get that bigger piece of the pie going forward. How do we do that? We become better agents. <laughs> so nonetheless, um, we know that the market has been changing quite a bit. Um, I mean, the numbers here, though, like based on what I'm seeing on the Denver Metro Association of Realtors, uh, March 2023 update, um, it's not exactly what I'm seeing on the ground and boots on the ground kind of situation. Um, let's get right into it. I mean, from from the stats here, right, we're seeing that, um, you know, with active listings at month's end, prior month, it's going down. Yeah. Based on, like going from like February to March, the inventory is shrinking. So that's pretty significant, man. Is that something that you're seeing as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird because, you know, it's down 8.3%, which is, that's huge. And yeah. I I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, there's still plenty of homes, plenty of activity going on, I feel like. But um, but yeah, those are the numbers. That's that's the real thing. I think, you know, a big factor as well on top of that is the days on market too. So while the inventory is mm -hmm. down, you know, houses are staying on the market an average of 48 days, which is up 4.35% this month. So... A lot of houses are sticking around. Yeah, hundred percent, and um, that's that's the part that I find a little bit more baffling. And I don't know if it's because like some other houses that have not sold January, February are still on the market, like increasing that average days on market, and it's almost like inflated based on that. Especially with the lower active listings and days on MLS increasing as well. I can't really tell you why that might be because what we're seeing is on MLS, if it's priced right and the right location, it's going to sell. Right. So looking at that, like based on the prior month, it went up for the days on MLS, the average days on MLS went up. So pretty crazy. If you ask me. Yeah. I'd be curious to see, you know, in that, in right in the middle price range between four to 600 days on MLS. Cause I have a feeling, I mean, I haven't looked at that recently, but I think it'd probably be like 10 days compared to, you know, those ones that are sitting forever, kind of just throwing off our data a little bit. Yeah. I'm wondering if um, the, let's say million dollar plus listings are throwing it off and those that want to sell it at a million plus or even higher than that, they're just letting it sit and just waiting for that market to come up so that the buyer can come as soon as the market changes for those luxury or mansion-esque homes at yeah. that point. So that's what I'm thinking. I mean, on top of that as well, closed homes are up 22.5%. You know, that's, yeah. it's showing we're still closing a lot of deals. Um, but mm -hmm. kind of the moral of the story seems to be price it right. And you're going to still sell it. If not, expect yeah. to wait a little while. Yeah. And we're so grateful for the Ruth team. Major kudos for even putting out this spreadsheet and having us uh, podcasters have such an easier time in talking about these stats within Denver. Um, looking at this, going into the closed homes, how month over month it went up 22%. I mean, with such a small inventory and closed homes happening like almost at that same active listings uh, number, like it's almost two thirds of that, right? Still, stuff is moving right now. And um, that's the part that I can agree with where things are moving, um, selling if appropriately priced. I mean, even some properties uh, are getting the early 2022 treatment of either over asking with a bunch of competition, appraisal gap coverage and all that good stuff. So it's, it's a little bit of mix. It's an interesting time to be alive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy out there still. And I know a lot of people are probably sick of hearing interest rates, this and that. So we probably won't touch on that too much, <laughs> but as, as we know, interest rates continue to go up around 7% mm -hmm. range now. And you know, that's, it's knocking out a lot of buyers and scaring a lot of sellers as well. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. Um, I think there's some some big announcements coming up in the next couple of weeks from the Fed and um, you know some of the economic reports that are it's either going to be really good or 
potentially we're going back up. So, mm-hmm. but we'll see. Do you know when those happen, Dan? Like the uh, economic reports, the Fed talking and all that good stuff. Do you know when those happen? Um, I just Google it usually once a month and it, oh, okay. po- it pops right up on a calendar. So I think the next one is the 14th, maybe don't quote me, but uh, I don't have mm-hmm. it up right now. But yeah, I, I usually just check that once a month because uh, obviously that it's a big driving factor in, in our business. So. 100% man. I mean, uh, I know early February, I want to say the first week of February, uh, we were hovering around like 5.9 or, uh, you know, 6% interest rates. Yeah. And now here we are now hovering around that 7%. I mean, these things change month to month and if even week to week. So it just constantly went up ever since the beginning of February. And here we are now early March with that 7% interest rate. And that can determine like, hundreds of dollars to be added onto your mortgage payment. And it's pretty significant. Yeah. I heard, I heard an article the other day that the average home buyer is paying $400 more just based on the 7% interest rate, oh. which it's, it hurts God. to hear that. Um, and I, I totally get it. You know, yeah. that's, that's a big chunk, but I think yeah. later in the podcast here, we're going to show you some numbers, analyze a deal, spoiler alert. And um, mm-hmm. we'll definitely show you the difference and how you can either, you know, just tough it up and take that hit for right now. And we'll show you the difference when, you know, the refinance process comes into play and it's not so hundred percent, man. I I am super stoked for it. Uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, as far as having the deal analysis, uh, getting people stoked and like actually seeing how we underwrite deals. Cause people could do this at home with their own calculator and, uh, they might be missing some things or maybe being too overly conservative with uh, certain numbers. Um, and here we are to not be a fortune teller. Let me just be clear here, but it is pretty accurate from what we're seeing, like how we underwrite these deals and what actually comes into fruition once we close the deal and get the rate locked in and all that good stuff. So I'm really excited to help you guys out in that. And it's not just long-term rentals. We're also going to be going over short-term rental situation, that strategy, uh, mid-term rental with like adding furnishings as an expense. Um, and it's a particular property as well. So you can actively look at it, uh, whether it has been closed or it, now it's under contract, I believe. So um, feel free to go check it out. Pending, we'll tell you guys yeah. the address later on. Yeah. Oh, so it is pending. Yeah. So um, yeah. that will all be coming up. But first, I know some of those people that are in the data and analysis uh, mode, you know, we got to tell you guys about the market stats first. So uh, we'll leave that carrot at the end of the stick uh, for the later on in the episode. Um, last thing I want to bring up, Dan, uh, on page two is that, um, with the close price, I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm seeing the close price, uh, let's focus on the median close price because the, you know, as we were mentioning earlier, a lot of these million dollar listings, they inflate a lot of these numbers or they're just not part of that bell curve within the 90%. You know what I mean? So the median close price as of right now here in Denver, or at least the 11 counties that this uh, accounts for is 562500 which over the month, over month, is up 4.39%. And a 4% mm-hmm. increase in one month, usually you see that in one year. I mean, that annual yeah. appreciation, I usually account that for one year. And here we are seeing it in one month in winter. That is crazy, crazy to me, you know, and um, it, it's, I think this, this says a lot insane. about the direction that we're going. Yeah. And this is the end of winter. We're not even in spring yet. So what are your thoughts on that, Dan? I think it's going to be, it's going to be crazy out there again, the spring for sure. We're going to have lots of yeah. people that are excited to be outside. Um, hopefully some things calm down with these interest rates and then, but yeah, I mean, that's a huge increase and I've been, I've been seeing it on the ground too. Um, multiple offers again. Um, properties going over asking, bidding wars, all the stuff we saw last year that we were hoping would, you know, mellow out this year in this um, springtime season. But this is, yeah. the, the data doesn't lie, you know, um, up 4%. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, I, I guess to uh, balance things out here, uh, one more column over, we see that close price, that median close price. It is actually down year over year. So Mm -hmm. that is what, uh, February of 2022, where, um, you know, like we were saying earlier, that early 2022 situation where you were getting like 50K to 100K over asking prices, (laughs) along with appraisal gap coverage, along with uh, inspection waiving and all this other crap. Um, Here we are now. 
Um, it, it's almost like it took that dip once interest rates were starting to rise like four, five, six percent. And here we are now, uh, buyers coming out of the woodworks, uh, as you might have uh, listened from last month's podcast. Um, buyers are back on the market and it's coming up from that January, February, or sorry, December, January into that February market here. So, um, yeah, that's just, uh, I agree with this number. I mean, it's, it's pretty insane from month over month. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do you want to touch on more stats or some of these, um, yep. you know, quick, quick tips in here are actually really interesting. Yep. Want to jump into some mm -hmm. of those? So for the local news here, um, Denver eviction filings are back above pre-pandemic levels. Um, January 2023 saw nearly two times the number of ev evictions compared to January 2010, too. So uh, that's pretty mm. interesting. It is, um, especially with these evictions happening for these long-term rentals, right? Uh, a lot of these either families or um, people that have leases, right? Whether it's six months, 12 months, whatever. I mean, that's where the evictions come in. It's not necessarily that short-term rental situation. So back mm -hmm. above pre-pandemic levels. So what does that mean? So before the pandemic happened, um, this is, it was sort of like this weird time, like with COVID, right? I, I don't know exactly what was happening because uh, I only just moved to Denver at that time, like late 2020. Mm -hmm. But um, with that, I don't know, maybe you can enlighten me, Dan, as far as like, were they allowing people to like forego rents? Can people evict at that time? Uh, what was that like? Do you know? Yeah, so pretty much when they kicked off the eviction um, moratorium, is that what it was called? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The eviction moratorium? Yeah, so once that kicked in, you, you know, you couldn't evict anybody regardless. And I think a lot of people were not paying rent, taking advantage of that. And so, yeah, now that that's lifted, I think there's going to be a huge back, you know, back flush of all these people that were just scraping by, taking advantage of that for the time being. So that yeah. definitely makes sense of why the numbers are up so quickly, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's saying even before pandemic, we're even higher than that now. So, and I think that's probably yeah. the effects of the last two years of people not being able to get evicted. So that's, that'll be interesting for landlords. Yeah. And, um, what I'm thinking too is COVID definitely put a monkey wrench in everyone's, uh, rental properties. And I'm wondering what percentage of these, uh, evictions are happening now that the moratorium is over, um, that maybe people have been taking full advantage over 2021, 2022, and things like that. I don't know exactly when that moratorium ended, but I'm assuming that uh, it happened pretty recently. I, I don't know if you have a date for that, Dan. I do not have a date. I, I think it was last month. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, so, so pretty recently. Yeah. Early 2023 for, for those people. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, it's, that's, pretty crazy. And looking at some other information to what you were mentioning earlier, Dan, is the short-term rental numbers. Um, yeah, the Denver short-term rental numbers finally caught up to levels from pre-pandemic levels as well, with 2,580 active licenses in February, up 21% <laughs> year over year. Oh my gosh. So the the competition is out there, people. I mean, with uh, I myself, I like short-term rentals and I operate one as well. And I'm looking for another one for my next house hack. The thing is, is that you got competition. You got to make sure that you're going to be a great host, landlord. You got your systems in check because up 21% year over year, that's insane to me. It's not like anything, not much has changed in the Denver area for short-term rental licenses, that permit application and all that good stuff. So um, you got competition, baby. So, and something that I always talk with um, to my clients is 80 to 90% of those of the numbers of her short-term rental licenses are smaller properties, two beds, one bath, or just a single unit. Um, and one way to stand out from the competition to be in that 10 to 20% is buying a bigger property, which is something I usually mm. always advise for any house hacker new investors so that you have those multiple options. You know, if, if your short-term rental is not doing so well, you can do medium-term rental and not worry about the turnover and cleaning, or you can do rent by the room and you have those options. But if you just have a two bed, one bath, and you're only banking on, you know, your short-term rental numbers covering the mortgage plus some, you're putting mm -hmm. yourself in a tough spot, especially if this competition continues, um, which I think it will, you know, Airbnb is a hot topic everywhere, not just Denver or Colorado, but, um, a lot of people want a piece of this pie. 
So yeah. it makes sense. Have multiple exit strategies, people. Uh, with uh, rent by the room, medium term, short term rentals, anything works. Uh, well, for the most part, as long as you live in it, uh, things get more limited as you make it into an investment property. So when you make it an investment property, that's where the short term rental licenses um, start to dwindle in terms of uh, possibility and potential here. Because Denver, uh, for those of you who don't know, you need to live in your property in order for you to um, have a short-term rental license and operate a short-term rental at that property. So it's uh, pretty unlikely that you can have a short-term rental. Um, I think there might be ways around it that uh, people are implementing and uh, circumventing, but um, it's not something I would suggest just because um, I like to stay on the better side of the law these days. <laughs> yeah. To me, not really worth it risking that and having your, yeah. you know, capability for future licenses getting taken away. Uh, yeah. That's why, you know, there's plenty of areas that you can do that, which, you know, hit us up and we can talk more about that. That's right. The experts in the field, the boots on the ground, boots can't, with the we fur. We can't give away ground. all the tips right now, you know, live. We got we got to get people <laughs> coming to us asking these questions. That's right. One last thing that I did want to bring up for the market insights, unless you have something else, Dan, is um, the mortgage news. And uh, this was something that was released back in February um, or maybe even early March, uh, where the FHA insured mortgages can now save $1,657 per year in mortgage insurance premiums on Denver's median priced homes. So pretty considerable, especially if you're putting down like 5%, you got good credit. You've been a loyal borrower and faithful uh, borrower. Um, you're able to save some money on those PMIs, the property mortgage insurances, when you start calculating out those deals, especially if you're house hacking or just finding your primary residence. It really doesn't matter because, um, you know, those PMIs, they can hurt, you know, um, it's like a couple dinners, uh, a couple lunches, maybe more than that, like per month. And uh, if you're saving like 1600 bucks, uh, over the year. I mean, that's, that's not bad. I, I think that's cool. Yeah, no, that's, it's great. It's going to change things quite a bit. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to see on the market insights, Dan, anything else, uh, that piqued your interest? Um, you know, I think those are kind of the big things right now. Nice. Yeah. Oh, one thing that I didn't want to bring up, especially as a house hacker and, uh, I'm looking for my next house hack is, uh, more and more buyers are expecting and even relying on floor plans being included in the marketing of a property. I can't tell you how many times I've been so annoyed with like no 3D tours, no floor plans. I'm like, come on. Like, yeah. it's so hard to judge it based on like the 12 photos that you have on Zillow. That makes no sense to me. Like if you really want to be a responsible listing agent, like stage it well or virtually stage it, I don't care. But then have a 3D home tour and um and also a marketing plan, like a, like a floor plan. It just makes complete sense to me. It, almost like it, it has to be necessary with your listing. Have a look at the listings that are on the market for 90 days right now and see how many of those, <laughs> see how many of those actually have a floor plan or 3d tour or just photos that were taken from an iPhone and yeah. Dishes in the sink and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen, uh, there was one listing, uh, there were two photos. You could tell it was taken from like an iPhone or like their cell yeah. phone. And um, one picture was of a light switch. And another picture was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just so ridiculous, of a light uh, switch. And there was another one. Um, yeah, like open toilets, like just close the toilet. Like something as simple as that goes so far in the listing photos. Like it, it's just so simple to me, e even just as a buyer and especially as an agent, like, almost like common courtesy things for your own uh, sellers for you listing agents out there. That's just me. It's our job and it's not expensive. It's like $300 <laughs> like to get really, really high quality <laughs> listing photos and video. So yeah. You're doing your job at people by doing <laughs> these things. Come on, do the bare minimum here. Yeah. All right. So now that we're done with the tips, the market updates and all that good stuff, we have a, 
uh, awesome treat for you guys for hanging around and uh, sticking around and seeing our faces. So we're going to go through a deal analysis of 8864 Princeton Street, which right now I believe is under contract, which was what Dan said. Yep, it is pending right now. So um, we're going to be going over that. I'm going to be pulling up my house hacking sheets, how I analyze my deals. Um, and then Dan is going to go over how he analyzes it and see if we got like similar numbers, what might be the best strategy for the place. Um, I think this might be a really cool way to like end the the stats, especially with the interest rates where they're at right now, but the PMI that they're at right now, even though it's like a pretty small sliver of what the actual PITI is or the mortgage uh, monthly payment is. But um, we're going to go over the, all of that with you. So with that being said, let's do it. All right, so here we are at 8864 Princeton Street over in Westminster. Uh, this place really caught my eye mainly because like I'm not one to really rehab too much. Uh, I like things that are pretty turnkey or at least like cosmetic finishes so that um, I can just go in there, make rents or make an income day one. So it's a $530,000 property, five bed, three bath, 2,500 square feet. Um, it is currently under contract. And based on these photos right now, not a bad looking place, you know? You got the um, flooring looks great, crown molding looks great, a lot of white, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. you know, kind of boring, but at the same time, like it still looks pristine. You know, the quartz countertops, appliances look really good. You got a built in oven. Uh, you got a three bed, two bath upstairs and a two bed, one bath downstairs. So this is the basement. The basement down here, um, I guess, has no egress windows right in the center of the uh, living room itself, but it looks nice. I mean, the carpet looks great. Um, it's got this decent gray canned lights um, and no egress windows in the basement bedrooms, too. So you got to take that into account. And that is something that we factor in into our... Um, calculations, the deal analysis itself. And also another thing too, is that it does not have an AC. So I definitely put that in there as well. And Dan can put that in there um, in his calculations as well. So what I'm thinking is that this uh, door in the back right here, if you could see my mouse, the, this white door goes right into the basement. And uh, this is what I was harping on earlier. There's no floor plan here, no 3D tour, like, come on. <laughs> I need this to know whether it's house hackable, but based on what I'm seeing right here, though, um, I'm anticipating it's uh, having that option to uh, go straight. So you look right here in the kitchen, you see that door right in the hallway. What I'm thinking is just put up a door frame, uh, having it open uh, potentially so you can live upstairs or live in the basement while the tenant or guest lives in the opposite side in the other unit. So with that being said, Let's go right into the numbers. Um, I'm a little nervous because this is the first time I've actually done a deal analysis with Dan. <laughs> so I want to see what he thinks of uh, my numbers and my expenses, my income and all that good stuff and um, see how we can like improve on each other's. You know, this is a collaborative situation here. Um, so property price here, 530K. Um, estimated rehab costs. I'm anticipating about 27,000. 27, so the reason why is because down here I made a note of approximately 15 grand for two egress windows. We want to make sure that those egress or the uh, bedrooms downstairs have egress windows so that they are conforming bedrooms. That way we can have guests down there, tenants down there, whatever. And so those egress windows, each one of them costs approximately 4,500 bucks, give or take, right? So with two egress windows at 4,500 bucks, that is $9,000. And then with an AC unit that still has to be installed, I'm anticipating, anticipating about six grand. And um, that could go higher or lower based on the season, the contractor and all that good stuff. And then the last 12 grand to equal this 27,000. And let me uh, zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see the numbers too. Um, and the last $12,000 comes from actually furnishing the place. Because if you were to live upstairs in the three bed, two bath, you have about $12,000 and that's still pretty conservative to get the downstairs, the basement ready for any sort of like the furnishings, the toilet paper, um, you know, decorations and all that good stuff. TV, um, even something as simple as like uh, streaming services like Netflix or Hulu or whatever that might be. You, you definitely want to accommodate for that. So now we're going to go into that house hacking situation down payment of 
Uh, loan amount is 5035. Interest rate is not going to be six and a half. Based on what Dan was saying and what I've been seeing this morning, and I'm going to timestamp this right now, March 6th, 2023, we're seeing interest rates at right about 7%. Um, PMI, uh, I put at 0.32% of that loan amount. Um, it's not going to matter too much. It's going to be a nominal fee, uh, loan term in years, 30 year fixed mortgage, uh, one payment per year, monthly insurance. I'm anticipating about 2,200 per year. And then, uh, monthly taxes based on the listing here on Zillow. I'm just going to be exact here. It's, uh, Never mind. It's going to take a long time. <laughs> I'm anticipating taxes to be about 3,400 per year, which is a little bit higher. So I'm anticipating that this is um, conservative. So $283 per month. So if we were to be living in that three bed, two bath upstairs, we have to calculate how much we can make on the two one downstairs. So we're going to be putting in this rentalizer. Uh, this is AirDNA. It's a really good resource for people that uh, want to do that short-term rental. They want to compare prices or see how the competition uh, shakes up within your area. So I'm going to be putting in a two-bed, one-bath with four guests, potentially. I'm going to update this and plug in these numbers just for a rough estimate of what we can get for this place. So occupancy rate of about 68%, average daily rate of 164, which I still find kind of high, but we're just going to plug in those numbers anyways. So 164 daily rates, occupancy 68%. So with this unit one, previously I had 167, which is, you know, pretty close to it, but I'm going to be punching in 164. So which comes out to be, if this were hundred percent occupied, $4,920 per month that we could potentially get from this place. We're obviously not going to be getting hundred percent occupancy. So I'm factoring that in and step four here, and that'll come up. So based on that estimated rent. So now we move over to the expenses. We got the PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance, and also the PMI, which like I said, is nominal. So this can fluctuate based on your credit score, how much the loan amount is and all that good stuff. So um, take that with a grain of salt. Average, subtotal monthly payment is approximately $4,000. So now we can plug in how much vacancy we're gonna be getting here. And based on what we were seeing on AirDNA, it's about 68%, but I'm gonna be leaving this 33% here. Uh, well, you know what? Might as well make it that 32%. You know, it's 1% off. So vacancy is now calculated into this spreadsheet of about 1,574 and some change taken away from this 4,920 to accommodate for that vacancy. Capital expenditures, I'm anticipating about 20 or $200 that I'm just setting aside for any sort of uh, craziness that happens, water heater breaks and all that good stuff. Uh, maintenance, let's say you need a lawnmower guy, you need a snow shoveler guy. Uh, we're also allotting $200 for that as well per month. Utilities, uh, gas, electric, water, trash, all that good stuff. I'm anticipating about 400. And you also have to include high-speed internet as well. As a host, a potential good one, you do want high-speed internet. Unless you're a log cabin and you live in the, uh, the city, you need high-speed internet. Uh, it's almost as essential as running water in these Airbnbs. So I'm anticipating about uh, subtotal reserves of about 2,368. Monthly expenses of 6,319. And you can tell as of right now, it's just not going to look too great going forward. So we actually go through this initial investment of about 60, 60 uh, grand, um, but the down payment of about 2,700 furnishing costs. Of course, this furnishing cost can be, uh, you know, fluctuating based on like what you can negotiate out of the seller. If you can get some egress windows, seller concessions, things like that, this is a movable scale, especially on like how well you want to dress up that basement, that two bed, one bath, uh, closing costs, 7,000. So monthly income of about five, five ish grand monthly expenses at 6,319. Monthly cash flow is about 1400 bucks. Everything accounted for. Well, most things accounted for. I don't know what else I could include. So with a cash on cash return, you're looking at minus 30%. To the lay person, this does not look like a good investment. However, if I were to offer you to own a property, a five bed, three bath place with a backyard in Westminster, 2,500 square feet, and your monthly payment is $1,400, I think you would take that deal. 
If you were to go anywhere else and try to get a five bed, three bath place, I think you would be renting it for probably three grand, if not more. And um, this, I feel like, is a nice subsidy to you living in your home, especially living in a three bed, two bath. I think this is a really good way to uh, at least get started, get into your first investment property. And what's cool about Westminster is that it allows one investment property of yours to be operating as a short-term rental um, when you move out of the place. So now you have a full-on five-bed, three-bath place that you can have as a short-term rental on Airbnb when you moved out of the property. And so I think this works out much better uh, in the long term, and especially if you refinance it. And Dan can go over these numbers uh, with what it would look like at 7% with his long-term rental strategy or uh, rent by the room strategy and what that might look like if rates go back down to 4%. And if you're making things work at 7%, it will definitely work at 4%. So at this point in time, Dan, I mean, I feel like I've been talking for like hours now, but um, <laughs> what, what do you think? What do you think so far? I mean, is everything, uh, you know, at least decent? Definitely. Yeah. No, lots to unpack here. Um, First of all, if anybody does not already have a calculator or is not using the Bigger Pockets calculator, which provided for pro members, reach out to us. Um, you know, we yeah. share this stuff with clients that are working with us. One of many resources that we have and that we use to help clients out. Um, yep. The next thing is I just wanted to clarify for people as well, as far as the reserves go. Um, these are not expenses that are directly coming out of, of your pocket. These are things you're planning ahead for. So ideally you're not using these every month. So when you take that out of consideration, you're just putting this money in a side savings account, hopefully a high yield savings account, which is earning 4%, building money, hopefully you don't use it, but it's money that you want to have on the side for things that come up because things will come up. You know, you are gonna need a new water heater, something's gonna break and you wanna be ready. So don't look at these numbers and freak out. And also with the vacancy, that's just being conservative. Um, yeah. you know, so that's the important part. Don't, don't focus too much on the cash flow part of it because there are so many different ways that this is going to benefit you. And also yeah. this is a scenario for one year. Um, mm -hmm. you know, typically you live there for a year and you get in your next one. When you move out of this place, you now have the five bed, two bath that you can fully rent out on Airbnb, which the numbers would look crazy different. You know, you'd probably be looking yeah. at three, 300 plus a night. Um, so yeah, it's all about perspective on this and, you know, just looking at the long term, not your direct first year, um, you know, this looks terrible. And, but yeah, other than that, definitely good work on that. Thanks, man. And, um, you know, you bringing up the, this is just year one statistics, looking at year two. Let's say you were to move out of this place and you have the whole place operating as a short-term rental. Uh, just to give you guys an idea of what that is, looking at my shared screen, average daily rate, 287. Occupancy rate at 61%. So if we were to put that in real quick, um, you know, putting in that number, what was it? 287 per night, punch it in. And then also vacancy at 61%, which is 39% vacant or uh yeah, 39% uh, vacancy is that. And so looking at these numbers, you're breaking even more or breaking even more. <laughs> yeah. Not breaking even more. Um, so even with this, like this is a really conservative capital expenditures and I usually make it a percentage of the income here. And 4% of 8,610 is a lot of money. Almost That's 350 bucks. That's a lot bucks. for reserves. Yeah, totally. And so if I were to just make this a fixed amount, 200, 200 much more reasonable. And I think that is, it is, uh, that is still conservative and you guys can still have like what, almost 800 bucks, uh, not 800, 400 bucks set aside per month, um, for anything were to happen, you know, like, like what Dan was mentioning, roof leaks, uh, contractor stuff, whatever that might be. So these numbers look decent now. And now you're looking at a monthly cash flow of about 500 cash on cash return at 10%. Again, this is year two. This is not year one. So if you were to bite the bullet here, live in a five bed, three bath place or a three bed, two bath upstairs and uh, pay about 1400 bucks, maybe even less than that because you're setting aside certain amounts of, amounts of money, right? If you can bite that bullet year one, you can potentially cash flow on this place year two. 
Just got to go through the short-term rental process. And if you need some help with like getting systematized, uh, knowing a good cleaner, handyman, and things like that, proper software, hit us up because this is all we do. And this is exactly what we do for our clients. And this was just kind of a random one. We didn't, we did not analyze this ahead of time to make sure it was a super good deal or anything. We picked one that, yeah. you know, so this is just an example for anybody out there, um, how you can quickly just punch some numbers in and decide whether it's not worth it or not to get out for a look or to dig in deeper. Um, so for my side of things, I yeah. am going to, I'm going to keep this very simple, um, quick and dirty. This is how somebody without MLS access, a non-agent or anything like that can just quickly analyze a deal like this. Um, honestly, I rarely use the calculator anymore just because I've done hundreds of these. And I pretty much know just by looking at a property, whether or not it's going to work. But um, for those who are new, this is something you should be practicing. You should be doing this every day. Um, yep. So for this this example here, I'm going to show you kind of how I quickly do this. Um, so pretty similar numbers to Ian, uh, 530 purchase price. You know, I don't really ever mess around with the appreciation or rent increase because that's, you know, you're not buying the deal based on that. It's something that's a bonus. So just keeping them at conservative 3% numbers. I mean, as we saw last month, uh, appreciation was at 4%. I think um, Denver's projected to appreciate around 10%. Don't quote me on that, but I've seen multiple articles um, you know, projecting some pretty serious appreciation coming up. Um, so interest rate, 5% or 7% interest rate, 5% down payment. And then I just kept PMI at zero for right now because honestly, that changes a lot. You know, it could be 100 for one person with a decent credit score or 200, yep. you know. So I, I just kept that out. Just plan on, you know, 100 to $200 difference. Um, so I use Redfin a lot for just quick, basic ones. Obviously, I use MLS software and, you know, tax records for more specific. But this is something that anybody can do. Jump on Redfin, put it in. Um, and then I use, you know, these are just... I don't trust these. These are definitely not accurate. So do not. You can totally look up the property taxes exact amount on public records. But for sake of time, when you're analyzing deals, you know, most of the time they're not going to be a good deal or they're not going to fit a certain criteria. So I don't like to waste a lot of time. So I just take the, you know, Redfin estimates for taxes and homeowners insurance. And then I just plug those bad boys in over here. So that'll give you you know, again, you're not going to buy the house based on these numbers. If you are going to go and put an offer in, this is something your agent and yourself should be working out together to get, you know, more exact, more accurate numbers. Um, and so for this scenario, I'm just going to do a rent by the room. And this is assuming that you're living in unit five and then the other four units um, projecting 800 a month, which is pretty average right now. Um, as long as they're decent sized rooms, um, clean house, and, you know, you do your vetting looking for professionals that are working or going to school and looking for some cheaper living situations. Those are your ideal tenants for these situations. Um, so then we can go over to step four. I mean, another thing to consider as well is like pet rent. Um, I would say yeah. 60 to 70% of applicants are looking for pet friendly places. Um, that's one way that you can really step things up as far as cleaning fees for pets and monthly pet, pet rent. So something to consider, but again, I'm not basing my, my analysis on that. Um, so for vacancy, um, capital expenditures, maintenance, I just keep it around 15%. Um, so this is technically just assuming about a month of the year vacancy at 160 a month. So again, these are just reserves that we're saving just in case for when things come up. And I'd say 500 a month is pretty, pretty good. Um, also assuming that you're self-managing, this is where the numbers really change a lot. So mm -hmm. if you can self-manage, especially when you're starting out and you're living there, I mean, I don't know why you would have a property manager if you're living in the house, but you know, <laughs> for some people that, um, do you know anybody that's done that, that does property management while living in it? <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard uh... of that. I don't think I have. I think um, the only person I have was Craig, but that was by his third house hack. By that time, he had like other rent by the rumors and he was like, dude, this is way too much work. So yeah, um, I, I mean, at that point, yeah, I understand. But house hack number one, not so much. Yeah. So again, 
play with both numbers, you know, see what it looks like at 12% and just kind of um, plan on that. So if it looks good that way, it's definitely going to look good when you're managing it yourself. And again, yeah. um, we did not pick a special deal to try and show you guys how awesome the market is or how great this property in particular is. We just picked one that, you know, it fits our criteria, five bed, two bath or three bath within Westminster, plenty of square footage and it looks good. So yeah. Um, with the interest rates right now, you know, you're looking at 4,357, including your reserves, total income of 3,200 and monthly cash flow of negative 1,157. So again, it's, um, you know, it doesn't look awesome, but when you take into consideration that a you're starting your investing career or continuing to build that and the tax deductions that you're going to be able to get on top of all this you know so especially for your first deal like we're saying you you got to you got to suck it up and start somewhere and also that's really not that bad and you're still looking at a net worth return on investment of 17% so mm-hmm. $42,000 down you'll be bringing in what 35 grand a year in rental income which after 2 years now counts towards income to qualify for even more loans you know there's so many different ways to look at it other than just oh shit i'm you know i'm still paying a thousand a month but conversation for when people get closer to that kind of area and then real quick here let's pop this to four percent so let's assume you know a year or two years i mean i hope that we're getting there that your interest rate drops down to four you refinance potentially even a cash out refinance, depending on how much equity and appreciation you built by that point. And now you're looking at a monthly payment of about 2,900. So how much did that change? Yeah. So almost a thousand dollars. Yeah. Almost a thousand dollars less. So honestly, like I know people are getting hammered with this. Like don't worry about the rate, uh, cash out refinance when the rates drop, but this literally shows you right here, how big of a difference that rate makes. So again, if you can just tough it out, you're getting yourself into a good property. Uh, you're getting that started. You're getting the ball rolling. And by the time rates drop again, you'll be looking for your next property anyway. So imagine when you move out of this place and you cash out refinance and now you're renting out the fifth bedroom and you're bringing in four grand a month and your total monthly expenses are about 3500 including these reserves, yeah. which are just backup funds. Um, you know, Now you're looking at a 13% cash on cash return about $500 a month cash flow and a 72% net worth return on investment. So Mm -hmm. if that doesn't show you um, how this does work, hopefully, you know, hopefully you continue to do some research and educate yourself even more, but this is legit something that I do. I know Ian does multiple times a day and we help people do this all the time. Um, You got to trust the process hundred percent. Yeah. If you're ever doubting your own underwriting, like we're here, send us a text, send us an email, whatever, like chat with us on Instagram, send us a meme. I don't care. Like, let's talk about this stuff, you know, because another thing that I want to bring up too, is that with the rent by the room strategy, it's significantly less initial investment too. Like with the furnishing uh, of the place, like you're anticipating like 12 grand, if not more than that, in order to make that downstairs work well, you know, and, yeah. uh, I'm maybe Dan was being overly conservative with that extra 10 grand, but like, you don't have to furnish as much with a rent by the room strategy. People are bringing in their own beds, their own TVs, their own stuff and living with you, you know? So based on what my calculations were, it was like 60 grand or more than that here. It's like 42 and a half. So definitely a, a little bit easier pill to swallow um, and going forward with it, let's say if you were to keep the, that rent by the room strategy, you already know how to manage it. Just putting in one more tenant. Now you're cash flowing year two considerable. Yeah. For the rehab costs, I was assuming a couple egress, um, touching up some things and a little bit of furniture. Yeah. So 10 grand is probably more than you'd, you would need. But another thing, yeah, I was going to talk about as well is the medium term. Forgot about that. Oh yeah. So, so yeah, just in general, if you wanted to do the 30 day plus kind of rental and not be fully running a hotel type model with the short term. So yeah, this is a super popular website for investors. Um, all these properties are 30 days plus for the most part. Some of them are single bedrooms. Some of them are entire houses. 
and this one here. Again, this is just a very quick way. This is not something that you should use to actually purchase a property. You'd want to look way deeper into the actual projected numbers. But mm -hmm. if you really quickly want to get an idea, um, this property, for example, four bedrooms, so comparable in size, and you can compare kind of the quality. Okay, my potential listing I'm looking at looks a little nicer than this, for example. You can pretty safely assume that you're looking at 3,500 a month. Um, that's just one quick way to kind of estimate if you were to furnish it and another yeah. example of how to run numbers that way. So um, obviously rent by the room would be not too much different, but um, you know, there's potential for, for higher earnings depending on the amenities that you put in. So yeah, yeah just, just another example of ways to be thinking um, multiple exit strategies, making sure that at least two out of the three that we talk about work and preferably have that backup of rent by the room. Yeah. Even though people might be saying like, man, I should have bought back in 2020 or 2019 where the interest rates are so much lower and uh, it, things weren't as expensive, like blah, blah, blah. In five years from now, I am guaranteeing you people that are trying to buy then in five years from now will be saying the same exact thing. Oh man, I wish back, I bought back in 2023, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes. I mean, the best time to buy a property was probably 30 years ago. The second best time is today. Let's yeah. go. Let's get through it. You, it's going to hurt at first. I'm not going to lie. Like my first house hack, we were bleeding money, maybe about like two grand, 2200. And this was over in San Diego, a high cost of living area. Now, over the course of three, four years, we're cash flowing off of long term rentals. And this is based on the appreciation, the desirability of the place, which Denver definitely has desirability. Like people want to move here. Yeah. Influx of economics, influx of growth, uh, population, um, industries are constantly moving here. And the mountains are here. Those are not moving no matter what happens, you know? So bite that bullet. It is not that hard of a pillow to swallow. This is going to help you out in the long run. And this is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a get wealthy long term. Yep. Yeah, definitely. You got to think long term and you got to be willing to take some risks. So, yeah, as long as you plan things accordingly, you should be fine, to be honest. Yeah. Nice. Um, maybe something, Ian, I think we talked about this a while ago, but, you know, if people are interested in these kind of deal analysis analyses, um, <laughs> Maybe it's something that we can do a separate webinar or get people to send us properties. Um, if anybody is interested in that, reach out to us. I'm, I love running deals, running numbers. So any questions or things like that, we can either make it a separate part of the show or, you know, do this once a month. But yeah, let us know. It's super fun for me. Yeah, I agree. This is uh, this is stuff that uh, is the bread and butter to analyzing properties. I mean, we're literally analyzing deals, right? If you were like questioning, like, how much should I put in utilities? Uh, what are the taxes like? How do I figure that part out? Like, we have access to the MLS tax records and all that good stuff. This is all stuff that um, we're very knowledgeable of. I can safely say I've done more than like I want to say like two hundred. If you ask me, this is something that I can easily um, get through and definitely help you guys out. Webinar is fine. Like I would love to do that too, Dan. Like it all depends on what the people want. If it's something that you guys just want to see monthly, cool. We'll do a monthly. We'll talk about it after the stats. Um, if you guys want to see it a little bit more often, let's say we do this weekly. I mean, if we go over one or two properties that you guys send us over, uh, send over to us, then this is something that I am more than willing and happy to help. So stoked on it, man. Stoked. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. Well, uh, with that being said, Dan, where can people find you, man? Like if, if other people want to do that rent by the room strategy, how do they, uh, get in contact with you? Yeah. Instagram or Facebook, uh, Instagram, Dan.Ginther, R E I, uh, Facebook, Daniel Ginther. Um, or yeah, just reach out in the comments on YouTube. Solid like comment, subscribe. We are both licensed agents here in the state of Colorado and we love doing what we do. We will treat you right, baby. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm Ian Jimeno, 720-704-3522. Follow me at ian.realestateagents on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. I don't do any dances, just educational material. So, um, that being said, Thanks so much, Dan, for hanging out and uh, chilling with the Invest Endeavor podcast, guys. I'll see you guys uh, next month with Dan. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Ian. See you soon.